This is a Jupyter Notebook, and I'm going to change one character. I'm going to then rerun it, and next I'm going to check what the effect of this is in Git. So I'm just going to do a git diff here, and there you have it. By just changing one character in this notebook, we see that there are a bunch of changes in the underlying file. Now to contrast that, uh, this is a Marimo notebook, and I can make the same change. I'm going to change this one character. I'm then also going to rerun this entire notebook. And if I were now to check the diff on that one Marimo notebook file, then I see it's just one single line of code that's different. Now, let's dive into this. So let's talk about Python notebooks, but in particular, let's talk about the file format that's underneath. Because there's some stuff in there that you might not expect. And in particular, let's look at this notebook that is relatively simple. It only has two cells, really. But we are going to see that there is actually a lot of unintuitive changes that might happen if I were to rerun this one notebook. So just to confirm what's in it, right? I'm just going to hit refresh here one more time, like restart, start from scratch. And I've got this one cell over here that's doing a bunch of imports, and this other cell over here that's making a chart. Just to confirm, right? Everything's imported, the chart looks as you might expect. And what's more, I can uh, rerun this cell and the chart will be exactly, exactly the same. So there's no changes in this chart whatsoever, nothing crazy with random numbers or anything like that. But what I am gonna go ahead and do now is I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. And then I'm gonna rerun this notebook inside of VS Code. And if you wanna play a little game, hit pause now and try to imagine what all the changes might be inside of the IPython notebook file. There's a JSON file format here. And just take a moment to think, right? Like, what are the changes that you might expect if I were to rerun this? Okay, so I'm in VS Code now. The exact same IPython notebook is open over here. And again, I've got a cell that's importing stuff. Again, I'm plotting something over here. And again, the chart looks exactly the same. But let's now look at the file that's under the hood. And in particular, there's a git diffing tool inside of VS Code that I can go ahead and reuse. And we can see a bunch of changes. The first one, and this is extremely subtle, is that if you look at the metadata that's inside of this Jupyter file, then there's this display name, which sometimes can actually refer to a virtual environment. And in this particular case, uh, when I was opening this file up, I got a prompt from VS Code asking me like, hey, what virtual environment do you want to use for this? And I pointed it to a local one that I've got made by UV. And that actually caused a difference in the display name in the metadata. This one is extremely subtle, but there you kind of already go. Depending on who is opening this file and depending on how they've set up their virtual environment, technically you might accidentally cause a little change in the metadata just right there. Now, if I were to scroll down, there's also another change. And this one is partially expected, but also super subtle. You know how in Jupyter Notebooks, we have this number over here that indicates in what order the cell ran? And in the previous notebook, I actually ran that cell more than one time. So before, I didn't have the number two here. Before, I actually had the number three. But that's not the only change here. Another thing that's different is the cell output down below over here. And that might initially catch you by surprise because the chart looks exactly the same, but the difference is in the memory address of the Python object that you are generating. Every time that you start a new process, objects in Python get a new memory address and the representation of an object actually refers to that. So you can confirm that two objects that might look the same are actually different in memory. And by rerunning a cell, uh, if you're doing anything with any Python object that has a memory reference being printed, then that's also going to cause a change. And uh, this is kind of a cheeky thing, but if I were to rerun this one cell over here, then you are gonna see that this is the bit that's different. And because of that, we also get a totally different file. It is super subtle, but minuscule changes like this that have nothing to do with the program inside of the notebook can actually cause your git diff to suggest you otherwise. Now, I do wanna add a little bit of a caveat here before I move forward, because it is of course possible that if you have very good habits and maybe also some tools that help you clean up these notebooks before every commit, that you can actually make life a whole lot easier for yourself. A large chunk of what you're seeing here is due to the fact that the cell order is also stored inside of the notebook. And if you don't store any of the outputs of your notebook and you make sure that the order in which the cells ran is compatible with how you stored it on disk, then you really do save yourself a whole lot of trouble. That's totally valid. But you can of course also wonder if maybe a different file format can give you other benefits. And in particular, I would now like to move towards Marimo, which is this alternative, and I might argue modern notebook environment for Python. 
that circumvents a whole lot of these issues simply by not storing this Python project in a JSON file, but instead storing it in a normal Python file. This has lots of benefits that I want to get into, but in this video, I would like to mainly zoom in on the effect that it might have on these git diffs. So let's contrast that. I am inside of a Marimo notebook now, and you can see that I've got the same code. I'm importing stuff on top, uh, numpy and matplotlib. And then at the bottom over here, you can see the second cell that is generating this chart. One of the main things that you're gonna notice here, by the way, is that there's no number in front of the cell. So there's no notion of, oh, there's a specific order in which the cells ran, and we have to keep track of all that state. Instead, what is happening is Marimo is figuring out in which order these cells have to run. So in this particular case, you can see that I'm using PLT and I'm using NP over here. Those are two, you could say, inputs that this cell requires. And those two inputs are defined in this cell on top over here. And that is enough for Marimo to figure out that this cell has to run first. And after that, this cell can run. This has a fun and interesting consequence. I can hit this play button over here to rerun this cell to my heart's content. And it will run in a few milliseconds and all that stuff is great. But there's no number that will update. And therefore, there's also nothing that can really ruin my Git workflow. So those are definitely benefits. But let's now actually look at the file that's underneath. Because we're also not dealing with a JSON file anymore. Everything that you're seeing here is an actual Python file that can actually run like an actual Python script like you would normally. So I'm in VS Code now, and this file over here that I've got open, that's the file of the Marimo notebook that I just ran. And you'll notice it's pretty small, and it really just has a bunch of Python code in it. On the top over here, we're just importing Marimo. There's a little hidden element over here that tells us what version of Marimo is running. This is something that can help us debug, by the way. But then we start up this app, and it's this object that we're gonna use to decorate these anonymous functions. And the way that cells are represented inside of this Python file is that every cell is itself a function. So we've got a function over here. Uh, the function name is underscore, by the way, but, but we can see that in that first function or in that first cell, we have that importing of the libraries that we had before. And then in this cell below, we can see that we are uh, making that scatter chart that we also had before. Now, a few things to note. This one cell over here emits a few things. It emits this NumPy module and this plot module, but these are effectively the outputs of this one cell. Whenever you save on disk inside of Marimo, Marimo is making sure that this file is compatible, but it's also making sure that variables like this, that a cell depends on, become inputs as well. So you can really clearly see that in order to run this cell, it needs two things. Oh, and by the way, those two things, those are emitted from this function on top. As you can imagine, there's a bunch of stuff that needs to happen under the hood in order for this to work properly. It could be that you've got lots of cells that are pretty interdependent on another. So you can imagine that there's this big dag of dependencies of all of these different cells that are connected, so to say. This app over here, that's going to make sure that when we've got a list of functions defined, that it's able to run all of those functions in the right order. That is something that Marimo will take care of for you. But as far as Git is concerned, I do hope that it's clear that if we're going to making changes to cells, well, we're not gonna make huge or unexpected changes to this Python file. Any line of code that I change in a cell will really just affect another line of code in this Python file one-to-one. -one. So small changes in code should reflect in small changes in Git, and large changes in code should also reflect in large changes in Git. But it really is a one-to-one -one mapping, and for Git, that really has a lot of benefits. There are two extra benefits that I do quickly wanna mention though. The first one is that because this is a Python file, it can actually run as a Python script. We have this well-known if name equals main at the bottom over here. So if you wanted to, you could just say Python git demo.py and really run this as a script as you would normally. No conversion tools needed whatsoever. But given that we've got modern tools at our disposal, there is also this one extra benefit that I do really want to mention that can help us make this notebook self-contained. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run this Marimo edit command one more time, which is the command that starts the notebook, but I'm gonna add a flag. I'm gonna say, hey, uh, let's run this in sandbox mode. And let's see what happens when I do this. By adding that sandbox flag, this notebook is now running in a separate UV environment, which is its own virtual environment, you could say. But because it's a different environment than what I had before, it's also complaining that these packages aren't installed yet. So let's go ahead and do that. It's installing, it's installing. And once it's done installing, we can see the output that we have before. Doing this made a small change to the file though. So let's have a quick look at that. Notice that we now have these extra comments on top over here. And 
these comments follow a TOML-like syntax. You can kind of look at this almost like a requirements.txt file because it's telling us that we have a specific Python version that we want and that this script carries a couple of dependencies. So not only do we have the benefit of having less issues with Git, because we can use UV, we also have the ability to make this Python notebook pretty self-contained. We have all the requirements very strictly defined here. And if I were to rerun the command that I just ran, by the way, so I'm gonna run this command now and pay attention because you're gonna see that on startup, it's actually gonna install all the requirements that we need. And when I now start up the notebook, it doesn't complain about having to install any packages. I still see the chart that I would expect. And I can also go to my manage packages tab and confirm that matplotlib is installed right from the get go. So all those features are nice, but I can imagine there's a voice in your mind saying, okay, that's great but I wanna store my results somewhere. Maybe you're dealing with a chart that's really expensive to calculate and you would like to use the notebook as a way to store artifacts as well. If that's your goal, Marimo actually still allows you to do that, but you're going to run that as an export command. So as a final demo of this video, Marimo carries a export command. And one of the export options here is that you're gonna export this to HTML. So what I'm able to do is I'm just able to say, hey, let's uh, export this one Marimo notebook file to HTML, and I can also specify an output file get to demo.html. Notice that it's picking up that I can run this in a sandbox environment, so it's asking me if I wanna do that. I'm gonna go with yes. And then this is what the rendered HTML file looks like. I wanna emphasize one extra benefit of maybe exporting your notebooks in HTML this way. I don't know about you, but to me, it's always felt like a little bit of a pain to get Jupyter notebooks to just render nicely online. There's always this awkward conversion step and not everything maps one-to-one. -one. So if you're interested in having static artifacts, why not store that as HTML instead of JSON? You can easily host it and be done with it. Marimo also boasts plenty of other export options, by the way, but just so you know, you can still totally export this to HTML or something static if you're interested in having an artifact like that. You can also take these notebooks and run them as web apps. You can host them in Wasm. But a lot of these benefits that I'm mentioning really stem from the fact that Marimo is just a reactive framework that just runs everything in a Python file. So if you're tired of your Git shenanigans with Jupyter, um, this might be a good reason to give Marimo a spin. There's lots of other benefits too, by the way, but this is definitely uh, a really nice benefit.